Our uh, final breakout session of the day, this is uh, Sacrifice and Valor, African Americans, Texas, and World War I, sponsored by the Texas State Historical Association and the Texas MAP Society. Uh, we got two presentations today that both promise to be really great, um, and the topics um, overlap a lot, so I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions until after the second presenter, uh, and then they'll both answer questions. Um, so our first presenter today is Dr. Lila Rakowski. Rakowski. <laughs> I got it before. <laughs> Dr. Ricosi is a native of Huntsville, Texas, who studied history and archaeology uh, at King's College and the University of York in the UK. Uh, she worked extensively in the heritage sector in Britain before coming back to Texas to teach at history at Sam Houston State. Um, currently, she heads up the military sites and oral history programs at the Texas Historical Commission, uh, in which capacity she is working to document the experiences of African American veterans in East Texas, um, who served in World War I. Uh, Lila's talk today is sponsored by the Texas, Historical, uh, Texas State Historical Association. So please welcome Dr. Lila Ricosi. Thank, Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, my talk today is a little unusual um, in that many of the talks that you've heard previously have been by um, academics and specialists in the field who have been working on their particular area for, in some cases, decades. Um, I am by training a 17th century British historical archaeologist. Yes, represent. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, in many respects, the last person uh, that would ever find themselves doing um, African Americans from East Texas in World War I as a topic. Uh, so the topic is not so much a finished product, or I should say the presentation today is not so much a finished product, um, but basically what I want to do is uh, talk you a little bit through um, how I got to uh, the project, and I'll explain more about what the project is, No Man's Land Project, um, give you kind of a, a very brief overview of the main, if you like, theoretical, and don't be put off by that use of the word theoretical, the main issues as I see them uh, in the scholarship today, and not just in the scholarship at academic level, although that's problem enough, um, but also the problems that filter down to uh, the gatekeepers, as I like to think of them, museum staff, county historical commission. Um, basically what I'm going to argue today in a truncated form um, is that there's a deep problem in the way that we talk about African Americans in World War I, um, and then that will lead into uh, the project, what I, in my very small, modest way, am trying to do to address some of those issues. Um, I'm going to give you a little taste of a case study uh, for, a for the larger project that I'm doing, um, and then I want to close out with, um, you know, a kind of a, a story about one of the veterans because, you know, we don't want to get too heavy on the, the statistical analysis because it can be quite dull. Um, and it's nice to put some of the issues that I'm going to talk about in sharp relief through an actual veteran's experience. So um, you're all here today, of course, because you presumably have an interest in World War I. Uh, and it's a very timely um, uh, period. Uh, it's the centennial of the American involve or entry into this war. Um, and I would argue, and I'm pretty sure that I won't get too much pushback on this, uh, that for most Americans, uh, this is thought of as being a very white war. Uh, certainly this was how it was presented to me when I was um, in um, K through 12 education, and I was a history geek, so I was actually interested in, in learning more. Uh, but you know, there was a reason I gravitated towards British history, because I thought, ugh, World War I, it's so boring, it's just, you know, happy, cheerful white people and, you know, British people with bad mustaches. Um, so this, even six years ago, was how I viewed World War I. And I won't bore you with the, the backstory of how I got involved with this project. If you're interested, you can see me later. But suffice to say, uh, six years ago, I found myself starting up a project from scratch um, on not these faces in World War I, um, but these faces, um, because these were not the faces that we typically here in the United States associate with World War I. So I became very interested in the African Americans, in particular from my corner of Texas, East Texas, and in particular uh, Walker County. Um, and for those of you who have started a labor of love project, you know how these things always go. You start off really small and go, just this tiny little thing, and it snowballs and gets bigger and bigger. So what ended up as a pilot study to 
count uh, the number of African Americans who served in World War I from Walker County um, down the line eventually became 41 counties of East Texas. And we can, we can have a dispute at the bar later about what does and does not constitute East Texas. I'm <laughs> happy to have that. I've had that heated argument many times. Um, but suffice to say, um, I started off with 20 veterans. These were 20 known people from Walker County that I knew uh, had been in World War I. And just to kind of give you a, a, quick, um, a quick anecdote, uh, on day two of the project, I went to, I won't name the name, but I went to a regional military museum and asked them, uh, and it wasn't a gotcha question, I genuinely wanted them to, to kind of uh, share information with me, you know, how many African Americans from, uh, from this county served in the war? And the answer I got was, oh, I don't think any did. Uh, so that kind of cemented my determination to count. So like I said, I started off with 20. Uh, the project grew and grew and grew to the point now where I have identified 11, a little over 11,500 names. Uh, took six years, but uh, finally got there. Uh, so. Uh, before I talk about the specifics of the data that I have started to read, I want to backtrack a little bit and lay out some background for you as to what I think some of the systemic problems are at scholarship level, so this is academia, uh, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the gatekeepers at the ground, you know, museums, county historical <laughs> commissions, um, and for those of you who represent those institutions, please don't feel I'm specifically targeting you. Uh, I know what you do is really difficult and you're in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, so all of my criticisms today are not to, um, uh, not to call attention to any, dif not to make criticisms of what you are trying to do in good faith. It's just to point out that there are some systemic issues with how we talk about this topic. Uh, and I want to kind of bring them to, to greater visibility. So the first thing I want to mention is, and you're going to say this is kind of an obvious thing to point out, um, is that the rhetoric of 1917, 1918, we're, we're, we should be very familiar with. And this was a rhetoric of, um, of, of white supremacist America that basically saw American, African American World War I contributions in a lesser light than white Americans. Like I said, that's a pretty obvious thing, but it'll become relevant a little bit uh, in a moment. So I want to just draw your attention to this, uh, this memo from the War Department, Office of the Chief of Staff. The poorer class of backwoods Negro has not the mental stamina, and I want to call your attention to the words backwoods and mental stamina, because I'm going to talk about those two in particular and moral sturdiness to put him in line against German troops who consist of thoroughly trained men of high average education. So it should surprise no one that in 1917, 1918, a particular kind or class or category of African American is especially put out for a particular derision, and that is the Southern African American. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, you see this in other documents of the time. In my work with, um, I, I go through all kinds of documents, but newspapers in particular, um, my experience with, with the tone of white newspapers during this period is when the, the US enters the war, you tend to see a kind of less, pulling back, lessening slightly of, um, uh, in the discussions about American contributions to this war. And what I mean by that is you come across a lot of local newspaper accounts of how even African Americans are doing their part. And, and there's a certain amount of condescension in that. But the reason I'm pointing it out is because as soon as, and you see a shift, as the war is in doubt, that tone remains. And then once the war is winding down and it's clear that we're coming out of it and we're going to win, you almost straight away see a shift back to business as usual. We no longer have to kind of maintain um, a everyone's doing their part tone. And there are many examples I could have used, but I pulled this one because it's particularly striking. This is from Camp Travis, and it's part in the World War, Texas. Uh, it came out, I mean, literally as the war is ending. Um, and there are multiple examples in this of how even as the war is ending, 
you have examples where, and, and this is produced by the US military, um, you know, oh, well, they didn't really contribute. You know, it, you, know it's, you see um, caricatures, you see quote unquote jokes um, that basically almost immediately show um, it's really white Americans that, that won this war. And again, I'm not saying anything that is going to shock or surprise you, but I'm pointing it out now because it'll be even more relevant in just a moment. This carries through, of course, through the 1920s, where you see all kinds of uh, popular media, uh, not just, of course, um, the Sunday comics, but also, of course, film. And it's worth pointing out uh, two things, really, here. One is there is a surprisingly thriving black film uh, you know, of course, this is the, the Harlem Renaissance, this period. Um, and of course, I could have used examples of how you have African Americans themselves who are trying to tell their version of their war contribution. But of course, that's not the dominant narrative that the United States um, sort of knows as a, as a wider community. It's this contribution. And there's a particular... Um, um, this, this slide is from, there's, there's two really, Exit the Front, which was from 1927, as well as Paramount's blackface comedy, Anybody's War, which was from 1930, and both presented black soldiers as objects of ridicule uh, to be mocked for their ineptness and lack of credibility as fighting men. Um, and so that was the, the kind of first thing that I wanted to point out, which was there is other, there are other attempts by African Americans to tell their own stories about war service, uh, but those are marginalized throughout the 1920s. And the second point that I want to make is, as many of you know, the 1920s uh, is unfortunately uh, a, a low point in American history in terms of race relations, violence against African American communities. And so this goes hand in hand with that. So now I want to get to the rhetoric of today, because we expect a hundred years ago for people to be using a, or having certain assumptions about uh, African-American contributions. Well, I want to talk about scholarship for just a bit because I think it has influenced, uh, again, some of our common perceptions or public perceptions here at, at uh, the kind of lay person level. Uh, the first is that s scholars have not ignored this topic. The last several decades, there's been a great deal of scholarship on this. Um, some of it very, very good. Um, this first batch that I showed you, um, the, a military history of what African Americans are doing is particularly per common. Um, some of them tend to be kind of general, uh, quite good uh, summaries or overviews, um, and others tend to uh, narrow the field and look at particular divisions. So for example, you've got, un oops, wrong one. Uh, you've got unjustly, Dishonored, which looks at the 92nd Division. This is the African American Division that uh, stays under, Amer this is the um, combat division that stays under uh, American control. Uh, you also have uh, several books on the 93rd Division, and they at least had the good fortune to be under the French, uh, which, as many of you know, uh, treated African American soldiers far better um, than Americans did. And I would say by far, the, the subcategory, if you like, that has received the most love from authors is the 369th Infantry Regiment. And many of you might already be familiar with this very famous regiment, um, more commonly known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, lots and lots of, of coverage of them. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that subject in a bit. Um, but Mainly the, the, the argument that I want to stress here is that the common theme that you see a lot of when you read all of this collectively is on northern African American contributions. This is what the fighting men of New York were doing. This is what the fighting men of Chicago was doing. And I just want to have a, a, a little disclaimer here. None of what I'm about to say in criticism is meant to detract from uh, the, uh, you know, it, it's quite right that we are drawing attention to what Northern African American men are doing. Um, but the argument that I'm going to sort of craft for you today is that it has dominated the conversation to the point where we don't actually talk about what Southern African American soldiers are doing. Um, the, the focus is solely on, um, on them. So of course, there are other types of books that have been coming out as well. 
uh, quite a lot on uh, the concept of loyalty, black loyalty. What are African Americans uh, doing? Are they, how do they feel about this, uh, this war to you know, save democracy when they themselves don't enjoy it at home? So there's been some really interesting work on that. Um, and also uh, some uh, forays into some very niche specialist topics, uh, all very useful and very timely. I want to draw special attention, though, to Jeanette Keith's Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight. I think it's a particularly timely book because uh, it focuses on essentially uh, race is a component of it, um, but perhaps even more so class. She's very interested in what um, not just poor African Americans, but poor whites think and do. And so as a result, a lot of the focus of the book is on uh, desertion and um, not all of it, uh, but quite a lot of it is on evading this war. And that's a really important subject to cover. She's clearly interested in looking at, at Southern African Americans, but still the focus is not really on what, uh, what they are doing. So I'd mentioned the gatekeepers. You know, I've showed you that, that scholars, while doing excellent work, are really ignoring what Southern African Amer American men were up to, and a couple of women, uh, were up to. And I would argue they're not s completely to blame for the state of affairs as it trickles down. Uh, but here are just a selection of comments in various forms that I have personally heard from county historical commissioners, um, museum personnel, uh, various people that really <laughs> ought to know better. And I'll explain what I mean by why I find some of these words problematic. Uh, African Americans were just laborers. Uh, the, the example I like to use is, if you're talking to someone that you meet uh, who's just back from Iraq, uh, and he was in supply feeding troops, you wouldn't go, oh, you mean you weren't going door to door in Fallujah uh, with, uh, you know, oh, <laughs> you weren't a real soldier then. We wouldn't think about framing a discussion in those terms, but we have no problem uh, using that kind of rhetoric when we're talking about uh, soldiers 100 years ago. And I want to be clear here, not everyone that points out African Americans were in labor divisions is guilty of this, because it's factually correct. <laughs> Many of them were. Uh, but it's when you, it's the slight phrasing they were just. When it is your main or only go-to talking point, that is when I'm saying it's a systemic problem and maybe there is a blind spot that, that we have to be thinking about in, when we choose our words. No one from around, uh, or none from around here served in combat units. And again, there's that implication of, well, obviously, Northern African Americans, because you know they're smarter and more educated and skilled, and maybe some from I don't know Houston or Dallas, but you know the the backwoods of San Jacinto County couldn't possibly have had uh, any of those kinds of. And these are actual <laughs> wordings that I I have heard many times. Not many served at all, uh, and what they mean, of course, is from my part of East Texas. Uh, they always assumed that. The men came from elsewhere, but not from here. Most uh, African Americans from the South were unskilled and uneducated. Most didn't go overseas. As if, if you didn't go overseas, you, weren't, you were somehow not really in the war, which I find a very appalling stance to take. Uh, those men that didn't go overseas still had a war experience. It's just not exciting by your standards but we still, we still should be telling their stories. They deserve that. Uh, so besides being personally irked by this, uh, I started to realize, you know, the people making these claims don't actually have any data to back up what they're saying. They're just spouting these things. Um, and one quick example I'll give you is, uh, I was email corresponding uh, back and forth uh, in, a, in a short, compressed amount of time one evening with a county, <laughs> I'm really not beating up on county historical commissioners. I, I feel really bad for giving that impression. But he, he did happen to be one in an unspecified East Texas county. Um, and he said, well, you, won't, you will not find any combat soldiers uh, from this county. Uh, and within five minutes, I had not only found uh, a combat soldier, but I found a killed in action <laughs> just to go, ha, I'll see your one and raise you another. 
Um, and he did have the, the kind of good grace to, to email me right back and say, well, maybe I don't know it's everything about my county. Um, so, you know, I, but to get back to my point, I thought they're making these claims and they have no data. Why not give them data? And originally, like I said, I was only going to do the one county pilot study. So, <laughs> yeah, famous last words. So what were some of the questions that I wanted to ask as I carried out this research? Well, some obvious ones were, well, how many men? How, you know, these, these were, most of these were, and I'm from East Texas, I can say this, they were rural backwaters, you know? In, it, or at least, you know, looking back fondly as an East Texan, I was able to go, come on, how many could possibly have come from, you know, this tiny town? Actually, as it turns out, a shocking number of men from very, very small rural communities. Uh, so I wanted to quantify it. I wanted to be able to say, from each East Texas county, here's your number. This is how many came from there. And again, if you want to know how, later on or have discussions about how I defined from, I'm happy to have that discussion with you. Um, what military units? Were they all, quote unquote, just? laborers, just stevedores. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I wanted to be able to definitively say, well, from East Texas, this is where the men went. Um, experiences, and that's a little more kind of hard to, to quantify, uh, but I wanted to get into some of those anecdotal stories. What were, what were some of the things that were happening to these men, good or bad? Um, and what kind of things can we draw from that as, as uh, historians or as history lovers and practitioners? What skills and what education? You know, I, I bring your attention back to that backwoods comment from, from the, the memo from the, the War Department. Um, yes, we all know that East Texas was rife with poverty. We all know that in the early 20th century, there were definite challenges, uh, not just within the African American community, but within other communities as well, in terms of uh, making education uh, accessible and available to, to a wider group of people. Um, but having said that, if we judge them by their own times and not ours, um, can we find skills and education among these backwoods, so-called um, uneducated people? And the final one is legacies. Uh, I was really interested in what are some of the long-term things that come out of that? And the, the, the kind of veteran spotlight that I'm going to do at the end of this presentation kind of teases that idea out. What are some of the long-term um, legacies that come out of this? And I'll just share a quick anecdote with you. I was speaking with uh, an 89-year-old woman in uh, Walker County, and I was green. I was sort of new to the project, and I, you know, I was like, just, I, I want data on her dad. That was sort of my <laughs> thought process. And she's, you know, talking, and she's meandering. And she goes, you know, I was in the war. And I was really confused, because I was like, mm, you weren't in World War I. But she, of course, meant the Second World War. Uh, and she was a dental hygienist for one of the uh, segregated uh, units in World War II. And then she paused. And I actually got goosebumps at this point, because she said, you know, my dad always thought it would be my brother that served at, you know, after him. But it wasn't. It was me. And she said, you know, I'm the first, I don't know if this is factually true, it doesn't matter, I think, but she followed up with, I'm the first black woman from New Waverly to serve in the military. And in that moment, I, I felt sheepish because, you know, I, I thought it was all about the data collection. And I realized it's not just about the data collection. It's also about what their father's and grandfather's service, how it impacted them, good or bad, um, and not just the families, but the wider communities. So these are all things that were informing my thought process as I went along. And I created the No Man's Land Project. And so you have, I won't go too much into it. There's a website, you can have a look at it. Um, and we have very generous donors, the Summerlee Foundation, Humanities Texas. You can see them there. Um, and the website is still kind of, it's always a work in progress. But the main aspect of it that I want to shamelessly plug in front of you um, is that there is a 26 panel uh, exhibit that is traveling. Uh, it just left the Buffalo Soldiers uh, Museum in Houston. And it is currently at the Museum of the Gulf Coast in Port Arthur. Um, and 22 of the 26 panels are the 11,500 names that I told you I collected. 
and they are organized alphabetically by county. And the example, I love this, uh, this individual here, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and name him, I don't think he'd mind, Mr. Washington. Um, he is standing next to uh, Anderson County, and the reason he's standing next to it is because his grandfather's name is on there, and also his four great uncles. And it was a lovely moment that he shared with me, because I happened to be there, and he was very excited, um, and it meant a lot to him that he could go and put his finger on his grandfather's name. And, and you know, and, and it was a lovely moment. So uh, if, you go to, if you have an interest in this, you can go to the website and see where it's traveling around. So, all right, now I want to get to the data. Obviously, 11,500 names, I am still crunching through an analysis and all that. But I do have a preliminary report to give you on one county, and that's Walker County. And I hope that it will at least give a snapshot of, to make us begin to think that, all right, well, maybe some of the assumptions uh, that we've made aren't supported by um, the data. So I want to kind of just walk you through some of this. Um, we have, won't surprise you here, but uh, a large contingent, reserve labor and labor. Uh, these are labor battalions, and the, these are men who, that were straight up used for essentially um, you know, the, the brute force of, of uh, hard, hard work. And it will not surprise you that when I crunch the data on disabilities, uh, the majority of the disabilities for the Walker County sample were men in labor battalions. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, one thing that did surprise me, forestry. 19% of the 529 men that came from Walker County ended up in, a, in the 20th engineers uh, in one of the forestry engineering units. So there's still a lot of labor involved, but these men were deliberately recruited, uh, or, they, or I should say that the, the Army was deliberately recruiting from areas with heavy timber industries, the Pacific Northwest, uh, East Texas, and of course parts of, of South Texas. Uh, the reason I think that that is significant is because I know there are varying degrees of skill within forestry, but there are jobs in there that are skilled that require experience. So I think that we ought to be changing the narrative slightly of, yes, these men are, the majority are not in combat roles, but let's talk about the sliding scale of what they were doing and how much was required. Why were certain men going perhaps into forestry, going into labor, that sort of thing? Um, Combat, 92nd and 93rd Division, 7% of the sample ended up in combat units. Um, I've had some people say, well, 7% is nothing. Well, think about a county like Walker County, or one of the even smaller ones, in 1919. When you have a man coming there, he has had a rifle in his hand. He has been shooting at white people and being told that that's a good thing for the first time in his life. You know, all it takes is 20, it doesn't even, it doesn't even take 25. For a small county, a handful of men that come back. The ripple effect within the African American community in that county where they can stand a little taller because they, maybe they didn't do that in the war, but they know someone who did. And there's that sense of pride. So I think that even though it's statistically small, we ought to be talking about how it is important and the ways that it's important for the community. Unassigned depot, 22%. Uh, these are essentially the men that never got out of San Antonio. It was like a black hole. They got in the war late. They got drafted in. They were cool in their heels at the 165th in San Antonio, Camp Travis, and the war ended, and the Army said, bye. Uh, maybe not very exciting to us, but they're still part of the story. Uh, Transportation Corps. Um, you, these are varying degrees of skill. Um, you know, you've got uh, couriers, you've got mechanics, you've got um, drivers. Um, the zero percents, I should point out, medical, um, I think there's one in there, Navy. There are, there are actually men in there. It's like one, one person. I have found less than 10 men out of my 11,500 that were on ships. Uh, but, again, that's still part of the story. Uh, medical, you know, he was an ambulance carrier. So SATC, Student Army Training Corps, or as some like to call it, safe at the college. 
Uh, it gets activated in um, October of 1918. Of course, the armistice happens the following month. So uh, it doesn't really take off. But that's an overlooked part of the story for Southern African American men. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. So I just want to touch upon one topic, because there's so many that I could have, could have looked at. Um, and that's the, the subject of education. Because going back to that sort of unskilled backwards um, assumption. And I've got a couple of examples here to kind of illustrate. There are, sometimes the documents hint at uh, information about this. So for example, uh, you can see here uh, Ed Oliver. This is a standard military service card that uh, if you attended Lisa Shark's talk yesterday, you know they're housed at the Texas Military Forces Museum and they're uh, free to access by um, familysearch.org. If you look at the back, it basically says uh, that he um, signed his enlistment paper using his wife. His wife signed on his behalf. Um, so you get these glimpses, snapshots, um, from, from time to time that uh, if you're not interested, you pass by them. Um, schools, I love this. This is from a yearbook from Prairie View. Um, there were um, a, you know, quite a few uh, Student Army training, not just Student Army Training Corps Prairie View men, but there were men that graduated from Prairie View and then ended up in various units. So they weren't in the Student Army Training Corps, but they were still college educated or trained men. But this is from the yearbook for George R. Boone, and I love how his nickname is Campus Agitator. Um, and it also reveals that he had, uh, in 1911 and 1912, he had been educated at Tuskegee. So he didn't graduate from Tuskegee, but, um, and it's, it comes up a surprising amount. It's statistically small, but I see these glimpses in the record again and again. Wiley, Tuskegee, Hampton Institute. Um, you know, it's there, we're just not looking for it. Uh, some of you might have already seen this photo. There were a series of photographs produced for Camp Travis, where I would say the vast majority of East Texas African Americans uh, went through. They, they went through Camp Travis, most of them. Um, and so quite a, I, I haven't done any digging in terms of how successful uh, these particular classes were, but the Army was at least keen to give the impression uh, that these classes were, these literacy classes were going on and quite, uh, quite successful. Um, just to kind of, uh, I, I want to kind of draw attention to how our narratives can harm the way that we, we look at things. Here is Willie Durham from Hopkins County, and you can see here Willie, um, and according to uh, his registration for the war, uh, just lists him as a farmer. Uh, he ends up in the 20th Engineers, that forestry unit uh, that I talked about. And we know him better as William J. Durham, uh, who helped desegregate UT Law School in the famous uh, Sweat v. Painter. Fascinating character. We're very happy to talk about how great white men of the 40s and 50s, particularly political figures, military figures, how World War I may or may not have impacted the great things they did in the 40s and the 50s, but we're curiously silent on how some of the uh, political, you know, political figures, whatnot, social figures of the 30s, 40s, 50s, how their World War I experiences might have impacted the things they did later in life. So this is a whole area that we are just, go we're leaving unexplored. And a, a quick second ex um, example as well, right, CUNY Price. Uh, if you look in September of 1918, so we're very close to the war, uh, the armistice, uh, he's just listed as a farmer, right, CUNY Price, doing his thing. And then one month later, he's in the Student Army Training Corps at Wiley. So if you look at one document, meh, farmer, meh, how educated can a farmer be, right? Um, we're bringing perhaps certain biases and, and assumptions to, uh, to, uh, to our eyes when we look at the, the documentary record. So I want to leave you on one veteran that kind of hopefully brings in some of the things I've been talking about, which is the importance of education, um, also the interesting trajectories that the war sends, any war sends people on for better or for worse. So I want to use um, an example that's, that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, Scott Edwin Johnson, born to an impoverished family in Walker County. He was one of 14 kids 
Uh, he had no schooling until the age of 13, and that was because up to that point, his family needed him in the cotton fields, um, and that's what he did uh, to, to make ends meet. So as a teenager, he finally begins attending a local school in Walker County, and I'll touch upon that in just a second. When the war breaks out, he's 23, and he is assigned to the Transportation Corps. Oh, one of those unskilled things that, uh, you know, just r mindless labor, right? Well, he's in the Transportation Corps, and while he's in Newport News, Virginia, waiting to ship out, uh, he visits nearby Hampton Institute, a historical black college. So, the war ends, and I don't quite know how this happens, uh, but Johnson, after the war, becomes a chauffeur for uh, Lewis Gannett. Uh, sorry, Lewis Stiles Gannett. Now, I was not familiar with Lewis Stiles Gannett, um, you know, when I first made this discovery, but I started doing a little looking into him. Um, and it's a really interesting backstory about Lewis Stiles Gannett. And if you will humor me for just a moment, I'm going to take a bit of a tangent into Lewis Stiles Gannett, but I promise I'm going to try and wrap it up for you so it makes sense. Um, and, and I, I do want to kind of preface what I'm about to say by saying I think that the two men did legitimately develop some kind of long-term distance relationship because um, Gannett's papers, or at least some of his papers, are at Houghton Library in, at Harvard, and there's at least one letter that I know of from Scott Edwin Johnson back in Huntsville, Texas, three decades later after he had chauffeured for him. So there's, I, I think that there was some kind of, um, and perhaps I'm reading into it, but some kind of at least uh, warm uh, long-term relationship. Um, so who is Louis Stiles Gannett? Daily book reviewer for the New York Daily Tribune. Daily book reviewer. Just think about the time uh, that you have to have to do that. He edited the mainstream of America's series, which you can see right here, uh, including The Lonesome Road, the story of uh, the Negro's part in America. And this is 1958. So here you have a, a white man that's basically showing, uh, as I'll show you, uh, a, a very unusual attitude about race relations. Uh, Louis Stiles Gannett corresponded, not just corresponded, but coordinated with and worked closely with W.E.B. Du Bois uh, over several matters, the desegregation of Harvard University, um, he, uh, Gannett asked W.E.B. Du Bois' advice on how to proceed uh, with the NAACP because he was on the board. And when Gannett dies in 1966, so this is the man that Scott Johnson had been chauffeuring for, um, this is what the African-American publication, The Crisis, wrote about Gannett, his obituary. Uh, and I'll just read a part of it. Unlike many of his contemporaries of similar heritage, Lewis, Lewis S. Gannett cherished his abolitionist legacy. There's that word there. Relatively few of the descendants of the 19th century abolitionists elected to participate actively in the modern freedom struggle. Mr. Gannett was one of these few. So I thought, hmm, abolitionist, abolitionist legacy. Who were his parents? Fascinating characters. It's all going to be relevant, I promise you. Next slide, I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> so the mother of Gannett, Mary Thorne Lewis Gannett, adopted a cause, or sorry, a slogan for herself, join some cause not your own. His mother was a Quaker who gained a certificate in chemistry in 1880 from the University of Pennsylvania. Her list of friends over her lifetime, this is impressive, included William Lloyd Garrison, Jane Addams, Susan B. Anthony, Booker T. Washington, Paul Robeson, this is his mother. Um, she was a lifelong member of the NAACP and the ACLU. Um, and there are some other accomplishments, but I'll, I'll move on to the dad. William Channing Gannett, one of the first northern educators in South Carolina with the Freedmen's Bureau after Union forces gained control of the region. He spent three years in South Carolina. I mean, fresh. The war is basically barely over. And there is a quote that I love where this is his father, Gannett's uh, father. He wrote in 1865 that local African Americans had, quote, a natural and praiseworthy pride in keeping their educational institutions in their own hands. What they desire is assistance without control. 
and he was one of the few white men who basically said, this is not a white man's burden situation. We ought to be able to offer assistance, uh, but not dictate. Um, now, I want to be clear here, I'm not telling a white savior story. This is not about, ooh, they came along and opened up his eyes. And that's because he already had a man who opened up his eyes, Samuel Walker Houston. Um, some of you might know him possibly as the son of Joshua Houston, more famously known as, uh, you know, a slave to Sam Houston. Uh, but what's particularly interesting and great about Samuel Walker Houston is he went on to get uh, degrees from Hampton Institute, um, uh, Howard University, and in Atlanta. So this was Scott Johnson's mentor. And remember, Scott Johnson was a 13-year-old illiterate boy who'd been picking cotton in the fields when Samuel Walker Houston saw something in him. And basically, through his school, um, which was the, um, which would go on to be, to be named Sam Houston High School after Samuel Walker Houston, when Scott Johnson finished chauffeuring for the Gannets and he went back to Huntsville, he said, you know, I think I'm, while I'm teaching here, in the summers I'm going to go to Virginia, I'm going to go to Hampton Institute, and I'm going to get my degree. And so Scott Johnson ends up getting his qualifications from the Hampton Institute, just like his mentor, and ends up becoming an educator uh, at first for the black students of Walker County. And you can see here, um, he lives to be 100 years old. He lives uh, to have um, a school named after him, Scott E. Johnson Elementary School, which I attended. <laughs> So, and it's worth pointing out, this is me in the fifth grade, which is the Scott E. Johnson Elementary School. This is me in the fourth grade, which was the former black high school. By the time I attended it, it had become a lowly elementary school. So, uh, and I'll leave you just again on this one quote, which again is, African Americans have a natural and praiseworthy pride in keeping their educational institutions in their own hands, what they desire is assistance without control. And I love this story because it just shows, again, um, how the war is sending people on this trajectory. Um, and it's the people in their lives that are shaping what they do with it. So thank you. I'm going to hand it over.